two, one. We are live in the present tense with Sam Stewart, 91.7 FM, WNJR Washington, and online at WNJR.org. Hope everyone is doing well on this Thursday night. I've got my second edition of Professor's Week here on the present tense. On Tuesday, we have Dr. Tim Klitz. That was an awesome episode. My guest in the studio tonight is returning, and he is a member of the philosophy department here at WNJ. Everyone, welcome on to the show tonight. Dr. Michael Wolf. How are you doing tonight, Dr. Wolf? I'm doing great. Excited to have you back. So, you know, I know with you, we're, we're perfectly fine to hop into the deep conversation right away. So, I one thing, prepared. <laughs> one thing that we were talking about today, or recently in class, is kind of this idea that comes up a lot on the show, the idea of what should people get out of this chapter of their life? What should people get out of college? And as a professor who's been at WJ for quite a while now, and yeah. in higher education for quite a long time. Oh, that hurts, yes. <laughs> so for you, you know, as a person who also, you know, spent time doing your doctorate, undergraduate, all those different programs as well, you know, it's kind of been this debate in today's world, like, is college worth it? But everyone, you know, who's listening to the show is probably at college right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for those people, what do you think the biggest advice is, and you're FYS professor as well, that you give to those people? What should they get out of this chapter of their life? I, I think the greatest value of college is something that, unfortunately for all the people who count beans and make loans and so forth, is, is very, very hard to quantify. Um, but I think the, the thing that I got most out of my undergraduate years and what I, I think I was lucky enough to get out of my graduate years as well uh, is the, the time and the space to concentrate on something, um, to sort of be deeply involved in some field of study, mm. right? and some way of kind of working on a project and really figuring out how that works in a way that we can't do if we're just teaching you like high school students. Um, you know, in that sense, not everything that I wrote as an undergraduate philosophy major was a work of genius or anything like that. But the fact that I got to do it lots of times, that I got to do it on a wide variety of things, that I got to, well, fall on my ass on a somewhat regular basis mm -hmm. and, and, you know, have people who would sort of talk to me to get me back off of it eventually. And then I enjoyed that in, in graduate school too. Um, I think that, I think, is the real value of kind of a concentrated education like this. People are often looking for really, really, really specific deliverables that you're able to, you know, perform this kind of task in a workplace, or you can, you know, code in this language, or you can, well, whatever, right? Um, and I think the thing that people won't tell you, and the thing that I think is really important, is it's a, it's a chance to dedicate yourself to some kind of study, some kind of project, some mm. kind of work that will get, you know, more difficult as you go forward, that you'll have more commitments, you'll have you know, jobs that want you to do 10 things at the same time and sort of figure it out just in time and so on and so on and so on. Um, so it's not that I'm telling everyone you have to you know, go read Spinoza, that, that everybody has to get deeply involved in a particular philosopher or something like that. It would be wonderful if you wanted to do that. I'm, I'm up in 404 most days. Yeah, looking for advisees, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. Um, but, um, you know, what, whatever that thing may be, part of what part of it is is figuring out, you know, on one hand, a project to dig deeply into, but also figuring out something about your own capacities as you do that. And one thing that I think too many people come into college thinking is, I got a checklist. When I'm done, these twelve to fifteen to three hundred ninety-seven things, whatever it may be, <laughs> that I'm done. That's my college education. Um, and I think there's a, there's a certain kind of loss involved in that. If you're sort of constantly trying to get done with something and get it over with, you're, you're sort of missing what's most valuable about this kind of experience. Mm. So. Wow, I really like that answer. Thank you. Yeah, and welcome. we're asking about kind of the education system at large. And uh, I think this is a... Um, about to get controversial. Yeah. <laughs> So for you, you know, if you had a magic wand and you could right. change anything about the education system, mm -hmm. and that could be in a wide variety of things, you know, but however you want to take it, what's one thing that you would tweak or maybe make a big change to in our education system so that maybe people have a different experience by the time they get to college? If, if we had different ways of mitigating the cost of it, 
I'd certainly mm. step up for any of those. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that, uh, I mean, you know, I, I, lots of times I hear students say, like, oh, it's really expensive. Uh, the degree to which everyone is sort of trying to keep it down and trying to sort of facilitate this for everyone would probably shock them behind the scenes mm. and so forth, right? But certainly, if I had a magic wand, um, and this would, this would have to be a fairly authoritarian presidency, I guess. <laughs> will completely reform how all of higher education is financed. I, I, I certainly, that's the first thing I do with my magic wand. Okay. But in, in, in part because I think that's a thing that sort of plays so much on people's minds, both as they're doing it and after they're doing it, that it gets in the way of what I was saying a moment ago, of mm. actually sort of immersing yourself in it. I think a great deal of that kind of like, I just gotta get this done, I gotta get this over the A lot of that has to do with feeling like you're under the gun because of those kinds of things. Um, and certainly, I mean, I think, um, I don't know, how controversial do I want things to be? <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> and can I just go back, I think a point you said earlier was really good. It's just this idea of like immersing yourself in yeah. things. And I think that really coincides with the idea that I think in an ideal world, it would be nice if everyone could just get that immersion experience and be fully like, yeah. say maybe like, with filled with joy and passion every time they yeah. step into something, not having to worry about maybe those external factors. And I think, um, especially my generation, I would say, you know. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, and, and I, I think a couple other things. If, if we we're talking about more reasonable <laughs> <laughs> kinds of structural changes, um, I like teaching the liberal arts place in that it, it's much much easier for people to kind of. Excuse me. Uh, kind of cross-disciplinary lines. Um, uh, if, if you want to go take a chemistry class, it's a lot more feasible to go take a chemistry class. People look at you funny, they, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, like, I did that a lot as an undergraduate, but I really had to kind of bend rules and, <laughs> and sneak through loopholes and, and, and those sorts of things. So, you know, I, like, in addition to being very interested in philosophy, I was very interested in science, for instance, right. chemistry and physics, right? And there was a kind of, and, and you know, I went to the University of Pittsburgh as an undergraduate, mm -hmm. so it was me and 30,000 other people who had no idea what was going on any given day. <laughs> um, and so there, there was a much wider variety of, here's a chemistry class, but not a real chemistry class. We're not really gonna, we're not really gonna do anything, right? And I sort of wasn't interested in that, and so I just went and took the actual intro chemistry class, right? And actually went and studied and did organic chemistry and you know, all that. Um, and I think it would be hard to do that in most places now. You're so sort of tracked and everything is so sort of planned out in various ways. If I could um, make the chemistry students come over and actually think about philosophy, I, I would do more things to do that if I could get the philosophy students to go learn more about uh, economics and chemistry and, and I don't know. I learned how to make a beer this past fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but even that, it's, I think it's just expanding your horizon. Like, I, I want you to make lasers, Sam. That's the <laughs> important thing. I need lasers. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a really great point because, and I think that's one of the things, I know you said that you maybe didn't necessarily have the classes you wanted at first, but then you went and took those chemistry classes you yeah. wanted. And I feel like at w and and sometimes I know you have um, you know, freshman first years that come in, it's like, why am I in this revolutions class? I was in a European revolution. I was like, I don't know anything. I don't really care about European revolutions. No, no, no. Like, I don't really know about it. But, but then you kind of progress forward, I think. And that's, yeah. that's one of the cool things about liberal arts education. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that's cool about the professors here is you yeah. see a lot of professors interacting as well. We talked about that today. It's like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. have professors come and visit who are, um, you know, scientists in the the classical kind of sense of the term. Yeah. Talk to your uh, philosophy of science class, and right. then bioethics. You're you're advising the doctors of tomorrow. So okay. well, let's hope. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I um, well, you you mentioned this thing, right? I teach a philosophy of science class. I sort of dedicate a day out of every semester, um, and have like working scientists from other departments come up and kind of tell tell them like, okay, here's some of the stuff we've talked about. What would you actually say about this? What it's actually like being in a laboratory and thinking about these really, really wild abstract ideas? And I have never ceased to be amazed by it. 
I mean, on the one hand, everybody's super enthusiastic about coming up and doing it. So the sort of snooty, like, oh, you're the weirdos on the fourth floor of Old Navy, <laughs> is not the norm here. Right? It's something about being on the fourth floor, too. You know, you're at the very top of the world. Some, something about being up in the belfry and, and thereby being the bats. Yeah, we've actually seen a we, You and me have actually seen a lot of animals up there. We saw like, a yeah. squirrel. We see a hawk one time. Uh, yeah, there, there was a Did... hawk that showed up for my uh, logic exam um, back in... Um, I, I, I guess this was back in the summer. There was just a hawk that, like, showed up and was staring into the room. And that window's like, open, right? Uh, that window was open at that time. Yeah, just, like, sitting, Can you imagine? Like, sitting up there just kind of staring at everybody, and I was like, wow, the college is really getting aggressive about academic dishonesty. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, a peregrine falcon will tear your eyes out if you cheat on this logic exam. Um, <laughs> That's not true. That they're not actually going to do that to people. Um, but I, and, I, and I should stress, like something like that um, particular uh, philosophy of science get together, where we you know, sort of bring people in from all different departments, and they talk about how they actually think about their work and how that aligns with. But WJ is actually a place that's especially good for that. Like I, I think I'd be laughed out of the room if I said that. At, you know, kind of many other schools, I'll just say. Um, and, and in fact, when I've tried to do that sometimes, I, I have kind of gotten chilly receptions from people in other departments, right? Um, one of the things, and, and this kind of goes back to the kind of immersing yourself thing that I mentioned. Um, one piece of advice when first years ask me this, um, which sounds really weirdly simplistic when I say it, but, but I, I do actually think this. They say, like, how do, how do I get the most out of the next couple of years, right? How do I actually get something out of this, right? I said, just find the smart people and do whatever they're doing. And that sounds like weird advice. I mean, it sounds kind of like, well, why would I look for dumb people or, or whatever, right? <laughs> but I mean, you know, imagine, imagine you come here to study one thing and you're working on that, but at the same time, you sort of realize, like, wow, this public policy class I never, you know, like I like working with this particular professor, and I never got to think about why all of these crazy things we do at, at a political level happen that way and why they work and so on. Or if you wander into a philosophy science class and you suddenly realize, like, what am I doing in the laboratory? Finding somebody who does something like that and just doing what they do is a particularly good kind of model. Mm. Right, so I mean, what it is to be really good at one of those tasks is something that, on the one hand, may come up later. I mean, why did I end up? Um, like, why? Did, well, one of the things I'm teaching this semester is philosophy of mind, and I've sort of uh, hijacked a perfectly nice philosophy class so that I can talk a whole lot about AI and kind of computational theories of cognition in the mind and so on. Now we're sounding like a podcast. Now we're sounding like a podcast, right, exactly. <laughs> so let me, thank you for What's talking. the real deal with AI? <laughs> um, and, and the reason I ended up doing that was because uh, like way back when I needed a summer job and I ended up with an internship at the Supercomputing Center in Pittsburgh, which was the sort of joint venture between Westinghouse, Pitt, and CMU. Hmm. Uh, Westinghouse was housing the actual equipment. So for, for a brief time in the early 1990s, the fastest computer in the world was in Monroeville. Right? Wow. And this is one of those things where they're constantly building a new one. So mm -hmm. you know, six months later, somebody else built an even faster one kind of thing. But for a brief time, the fastest computer in the world was off of 376. Hmm. So on your way to the hall kind of thing. Right? Um, they called it Mario because it was the 90s. Mario Lemieux was a semi-divine figure in the, in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, but I ended up in that job, and I, I don't want to suggest for a moment that I was actually being allowed to run a supercomputer. We're right. clipping the podcast, Dr. Wolf invented that computer. <laughs> I invented the crazy Y90. Um, you know, I was making making copies and delivering food. And, and, you know, gopher stuff, right? Yeah, okay. uh, work study kinds of jobs. But it meant that there was a significant part of any given day where there would be a workshop where they'd be talking about some new kind of technology or some way of optimizing the programming that you do for these kinds of machines. Um, and it was easy for me to sneak into something like that. 
mm. and kind of sit in the back. And as long as I didn't bother anybody, they think it's like, oh, he's here to get the cart later or something like that. <laughs> so don't be worried about it. But it meant that I kind of got to sit there and you know figure out, okay, so what are these projects really about? What is it that these people who got these very, very special jobs do especially well, better than anybody else does? Mm. Uh, why do they worry about those problems? And that's not, if I'd gone and taken, you know, I don't know, whatever intro to computer science there was at, at, at Penn at the time, I, I don't think I would have learned any of that. I, or at least I would have learned a version of it that was so digested and watered down that mm. it wouldn't have made much difference. So that was a that was a piece of luck for me that I kind of landed in this place with really really smart people doing really really kind of interesting work, and just by watching it happen sometimes, that meant that I got something that would be hard to get in any other setting, right? And I think while that's a real piece of luck, right? I think you can do something like that in almost any setting, right? Find the people who are unusually smart find the people who are unusually driven and creative and, and so on, and just get involved in that. I mean, we have this sort of two program requirement going forward at the college, right? Everybody's gonna do two things All right. from now on, yeah, yeah, right? Um, we're sort of folding this into the catalog and it's part of the future, mm -hmm. right? And I, I think a lot of people probably think about it in very, very kind of calculated terms, right? Mm -hmm. That I'm gonna, major in biology because I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to do this other thing that'll you know, help me run a business or, or something mm. like that, right? Uh, that might be a perfectly good way for you to do something. You find the right person, right? the right smart people doing something interesting, maybe that would work. But um, it's also often the case that people are sort of calculating that so much that they're missing that kind of second possibility of getting sort of deeply immersed in something understanding what it is to really intellectually engage with something over the course of, you know, decades. What that would take, what kind of skills you have to develop, and so on. Uh, that was a valuable thing for me. That's a thing, and, and getting back to what we're saying, th that's, that's a thing that you can do much more readily here than I think you could in a lot of places. Wow. There, there, there are things that I hear about students doing that you know, I think about the hoops I would have had to jump through and the tricks I would have had to pull to be able to do that when I was an undergraduate. Um, at a very different kind of school with very different kinds of expectations. Uh, so this is this is my, um, I, I, I said I was gonna say controversial things, but now I'm actually just praising the institute. <laughs> well, I think it's all, it's also kind of an uh, ordeal of what you make of it. Like, yeah. you know I mean? You could take classes that maybe just kind of go on one track, stick to your, but like, you know, I didn't know I was going to do philosophy. I certainly didn't know where to go to film school. And then, you know, I think, I was just thinking all the way over here, I was like, hmm, like you don't really think of like films as sometimes being philosophical, but then it's like, there are a lot of things that have helped me in philosophy and my filmmaking. And I feel like, and vice versa. Um, so I think those things can be really complimentary. And, you know, it's funny, you know, you're throwing in some jokes there and I, I, I will give the reason why I mentioned that in just a second. Um, <laughs> You published a book, uh, 50 Short Essays on the Philosophy of Language. We talked about it a little last time. And I think the cool part about radio shows and, and podcasts such as this is people can learn from experts as if you know they are in your class. So I would like to ask you a few questions uh, uh, from your book and just about the chapters. I'd like sure. to you know maybe get your take on why you're interested in this particular part of the philosophy of language and maybe give the people a few sound bites about what this is kind of all about. Mm -hmm. So uh, we want some minutes here. We'll do a couple before the break here. So. I picked out a couple of chapters I think people would find particularly interesting, but also in your bio, um, along with the jokes I know you made, um, you know, all the time, it says you're into philosophy of humor, and in chapter 32 of this book, essay 32, it talks about jokes. So what do jokes have to do with philosophy, Dr. Wolf? Jokes are an interesting kind of speech act, okay? Sometimes when you want to think about what someone is doing by speaking, you want to be thinking in very kind of clean cut and dry logical terms about meanings and semantics of things that people are saying. So I might have to worry about uh, the meaning of a word like podcast, right? What does that imply? Maybe I think about what it designates. Those are semantic questions, right? There are also things that you can do with words to borrow a little something from British philosopher J.L. Austin. 
um, that aren't necessarily parts of the meanings, but may kind of take place in the act of saying them. So imagine I said something to you like, saying the door is open, right? In a lot of contexts, that would kind of imply like, Sam, go close the door, right? Oh, yeah. now, that's not what that sentence means in a very, very strict sense, right? But that might be something that's sort of accomplished by the act. Now, in another context, maybe I could do something dramatically different with it. Imagine I'm trying to give you a pep talk, right? You you have to go out on this big, uh, life-changing adventure of some kind, and you're feeling a little queasy, and uh, you know, I'm trying to get you psyched up about it. Let's just so, say go out on the pitching mound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure, that'll work, right? Um, and I say, Sam, one day you're gonna have to walk through that door. And Sam, the door is open. And this is your kind of... Wow, let me run through this break. Let me run through this wall real quick. <laughs> <laughs> this is my Newt Rockney moment or whatever. Um, uh, you know, that sentence, it's not that the words themselves have changed, but what it's being, what's being done with it in the act mm -hmm. has changed a lot. So think about a joke and what a strange little linguistic action telling a joke is. So I, I heard you made a joke that, that okay. you were getting your kidney replaced, or was it? So how does that fit into the philosophy of jokes? Um, <laughs> well, I, 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 will, I, will, I, I will tell you that in just a moment. Okay. okay. Um, but, 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 okay, so, so think about, you know, one thing that's obvious about a joke is most jokes have the form of reports. Like you say something as though it were literally true. Sometimes you even tell it as a kind of a longer story. Like the chicken crosses the road. Right, the chicken crosses the road. Um, imagine somebody who didn't get that that was not really part of the joke. That it's not really a report. Like I have this problem, I especially have this problem with one or two of my friends on social media, mm -hmm. where I will say you know something that's clearly humorous or clearly not to, meant to be taken seriously, and they will read it very, very, very literally. So I'll say something like, oh, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. And they'll be like, you eat horses? Oh my God. Like, you know. <laughs> to get a joke, you kind of have to understand, oh, we're doing a different kind of performance. This is a different mm -hmm. kind of action, right? You're not supposed to really think that this thing is true, right? But you're supposed to sort of treat it with a pretense, as though it were true, just for the purposes of this little action, okay? So imagine I said to you, let me tell you a story. Uh, Grasshopper walks into a bar, right? The bartender says, hey, we have a drink named after you. And the grasshopper says, why would you have a drink named Steve? <laughs> and, <laughs> and you, you think about that joke, right? Um, I was, I'm, I'm talking about this joke with my wife. That, that's an old, old, old joke. <laughs> it's a nice, it's a nice concept. See, I love corny jokes. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I, I, I'm not sure whether grasshopper works because that's such an old drink. Like I, don't I, even, I just assumed it was a drink. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I have to change this to a screwdriver or yeah. you know, like I don't, I don't know that I don't know the joke works if I say Long Island iced tea or something like that. <laughs> Tequila Sunrise. <laughs> right, right. Tequila Sunrise walks into a bar. Like, what a drink name after you? Why are you named Steve? Um, or why is it named Steve? Um, so nobody thinks that's literally a report of a thing that happened with a giant talking grasshopper. Mm -hmm. I say that I. When I imagine it, it's a giant grasshopper. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a, maybe some people imagine it's a tiny grasshopper, and the bartender has to lean over. No, I imagine it's like an anthropoid yeah, yeah, yeah. grasshopper, which is kind of terrifying. Yeah, like that. a six foot tall insect <laughs> walks into your bar. And, and like, hey, I'll have that. Like, okay. Um, Interesting. So, so, so you think about that, right? Mm -hmm. This has the kind of form of a report, like an actual assertion about something in the world, but it's clearly not. What are you doing with it instead? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, there are lots of uh, sort of very granular philosophical analyses about like, here's how this kind of joke works. Here's what makes a pun different from a shaggy dog story from, you know, just a straight head joke or whatever. Uh, I've actually written on this because I think there's an answer to that, which is, I think all jokes, and here's the bold thesis statement, I think all jokes uh, are about pointing out a certain kind of break with a norm, okay? Mm. So there's something surprising about them, there's something incongruous about them, these are things that other people describe. You're kind of pointing out that someone's wrong about something. So in this joke, 
where the grasshopper's talking to the bartender, we have to have a confusion about kind of the grammar of this, right? The strikingness is the sort of incongruous part. Like right? we have this anthropoid grasshopper who has walked in and you know, is about to order a drink or whatever. Um, why do you point out that things have gone wrong? Why would you point out that, oh, you know, this has gone off the rails, right? Well, I, I think very, very kind of fundamental kind of jokes are about um, making fun of someone and someone's kind of deviation from some kind of norm. If you think about most jokes, they're about someone being stupid or someone being kind of egotistical or someone having some kind of flaw like that. Right? In a way, if I make that joke to someone, I'm kind of kicking them out of the community for just a second. I'm kind of like putting them on notice. Right. They can do one of two things. They can kind of not take the joke, right? Not appreciate it and so on and so forth. And okay, maybe we found out that there's a problem here. Maybe we found out there's a kind of flaw. But a lot of people will be like, oh yeah, you're right. right? So I mean, you can goof on me about being a philosophy professor or whatever, right? What do we do? Oh, well, we all take the joke. We all feel better. And we right? say that person has a good sense of humor, right? Yeah, exactly, right? And so, right, they're okay with being checked. They're not too haughty. They're one of us, mm -hmm. as it were, okay? So what do you do with that joke? You build solidarity with it, mm. okay? So you build a community where I can, you know, rib you a little bit, right? And you'll be like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, weird left-handed pitcher who throws too many curveballs. Or <laughs> I'm a philosopher, yes. I sit around on the fourth floor in my toga. And, you know, we tell jokes like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and having a sense of humor about it is to kind of let people kind of point to you and point out your unusual qualities, but then kind of say, but you're really welcome. You can come back, right? Now that's solidarity building humor. Now, of course, we can do other things, right? On the one hand, we can have jokes where we really don't take it back. That's really about building solidarity with the people who are kind of in the group rather than the people who are out of the group. Like a bully makes a joke. Right, that would be one way, right? But also, I mean, you can think of that being morally cruel but the bully makes the joke against the weak kid in class or whatever. But you can also think of it as, in some cases, a kind of morally, you know, almost righteous kind of act. Like, we know that this person's just awful, right? So, I mean, you think about it like, well, uh, uh, the producers, the uh, uh, Mel Brooks musical. Um, okay, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's about putting on a musical and they're trying to make it fail, right? They're, they're okay. going to pull off a scam with the funding if they can make it fail. So they're like, we've got to make the worst musical we possibly can. So they make it a joke about, excuse me, they make it a musical, musical about Nazis. Oh, geez. And it, it, like, there's an Adolf Hitler character and so on. And it's, it's just the worst musical ever, right? And you might say, like, does this mean that Mel Brooks loves Nazis? No, no, no. Mel Brooks is trying to make us laugh at Nazis. So it's like on Cartman when he makes fun of like Kyle for being Jewish. It's you're not you're supposed to be laughing at Cartman. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You're, you're, you're like Cartman's such an idiot. He's yeah. the sort of indirect object of derision. Right. right. Um, so you know, I, I don't think Mel Brooks is like secretly pro-Nazi and thinks it's really funny that they did these horrible things. I think he's holding them up to ridicule, and he wants his audience to kind of join with him, like creating solidarity. I feel like some people miss the point of this yeah. nowadays. It's like I think a lot of people miss the point. Yeah, of course. I think South Park's a great example. It's like you're not laughing at Cartman because you agree with all his like terrible views. It's like look at this idiot little kid who has all these views. Right. Yeah. You're, you're supposed to be doing that, right? But yeah, that's that's a danger with satire that people will think like, oh, that is my hero. Exactly. <laughs> like, like, um, if you ever see the producers. Hitler's not going to be your hero at the end of it, don't worry. <laughs> right. But so, what do you do with humor? You build solidarity, okay? Now you can do that a bunch of ways. Sometimes what I do is, you know, if, if we really think that this person's morally awful, right, we make fun of that. Like Mel Brooks making fun of Hitler, right? Um, if we're just doing this kind of joking around with each other, we're kind of, you know, it's almost like play fighting, if you mm -hmm. think that way, right? But everybody's cool at the end of it, we can all take a joke. We build celebrity that way. You mentioned corny jokes a moment ago, right? When you talk about a grasshopper walking into a bar, I don't believe that I'm oppressing grasshoppers when I say that. I don't believe that I'm building solidarity with bartenders, right? But that is such a kind of featureless, contextless joke that I can tell that to you, 
I once told that joke to my wife's father when I was kind of trying to make sure we were going to get along. I think. Did you think it was uh, funny? Yeah, he did. Good. He, very, <laughs> he, he did have a really good sense of humor. Um, and, you know, I have an article that features a version of that joke, right? Uh, because you can tell that to anybody, anytime, anywhere, right? It's almost like a, something so kind of unspecific that anybody can use that to build a little bit of solidarity with somebody when first meeting them. Here's another thing I can do, and I am getting back to my kidney, don't worry. Um, uh, I can make a joke about myself, right? Self-deprecating humor. Now, if I do this too much, that's probably a sign that I should book an appointment with a therapist, right? If I'm <laughs> always kind of knocking myself. But if I knock myself a little bit, I'm showing to an audience that I can kind of take a joke, right? I'm kind of showing like, oh, I don't know, we're all the same team, it's okay. I don't, I don't think I'm sort of too far outside your circle even. You know, sometimes people in authority will do this just to kind of drop the anxiety level in the room a little bit. It's kind of like, no, 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 I'm okay, it's fine, right? Um, so why do I get up in front of a class and say that I'm having a kidney transplant? Um, that that was a very spontaneous on the spot kind of. It's a very Dr. Wolf joke. It's a very Dr. That's like Wolf the kind of death and uh, <laughs> FYS sprinkled in there. Like yes, this is true. So so I had to um, I, had, I had to cancel a Friday class for a, a personal matter, um, and that never happens. Like I, I I I am the most. I will be there every day. We will be on the thing that's on the syllabus. No 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 stopping me. No right? So even these students who only have me for a few weeks and have sort of figured out the da 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 will do this this day, I'm very much on schedule, are a little surprised when I say that I'm canceling that Friday class. And they looked a little quizzical and they, you know, and they were sort of like, what, what, what does this mean? Is there something going on? Do we have to do we have to worry about this? And saying, oh yeah, I gotta get a kidney transplant. Uh, I want to get this done before the weekend. Don't worry, we'll be back on Monday, right? Is a way of kind of lowering the temperature of the room, lowering the, confu lowering the confusion, just kind of saying like, oh yeah, I know this is a weird thing. I'm making a joke about it, right? I'm building solidarity with these students that I'm getting to know and so forth. And I, I felt bad <laughs> to the fact because a couple of students who have had classes with me um, kind of wrote me emails that weekend or said something you know, in, in the interim where they were like, well, I really hope your kidney transplant goes okay. I, I, I hope you come come back even stronger. And, you know, like, I, I, I'm glad they found a donor. And I'm like, it, it, no, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> this didn't work. The joke failed. The joke failed. If it was like a Friends episode, it would be like, they'd show up with like flowers at your door and all this stuff. And the joke would keep getting deeper. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right? President would come. And that's a little bit of that is what happened, right? So oh. there were these very concerned emails like, I really appreciate everything you've done through in this class. I'm like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> but my, my favorite part of this was um, I, um, I saw a student... Uh, well, she, she missed that Monday class after we came back, and I wrote to her and said, like, it's okay, I'm fine. It was, it was a joke, and I clearly didn't frame the joke thoroughly enough, and, and so on. Um, and I had this whole bit that I was going to say to her about, like, oh, Gen X humor versus Gen Z humor. And, you know, Gen X, it's all dark sarcasm, and Gen Z, it's all this absurdism stuff, and, you know, and I, I can't say the term, but uh, S-posting, let's just say, right? That's not a thing I can say in WJR. Uh, and I had I had this thing that I was going to say to her. I was kind of you know to make to make really clear that no no this is on me. Mm -hmm. And so I saw her, and she said like oh God, I can't believe I felt that I can't believe I didn't understand it wasn't a joke. And I was like oh Gen X Gen Z right dark sarcasm. And she stopped me before I got two sentences in. She said no no no, no I, I I totally understand the dark sarcasm versus the absurdist like I, I'm totally clear on that. It's just that when you said, I'm going to get a kidney transplant on Friday and we're still having class on Monday, that was something I believed you would do. <laughs> I, I, I completely believed you'd be like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'll make it up the stairs, it's fine, it's fine, we don't have to cancel class. That, 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 like, so I thought, yeah, you win, you win, that's it. <laughs> You're right. 
<laughs> it is very much in character that I would do something that ridiculous, yes. So she she wins, right? Yeah. Well, thank you for that summary on jokes. We've got to get okay. to some other topics, but okay. first we have the uh, news play here. You're listening to the presentation with Sam Stewart at 91.7 FM at WNJR Washington online at WNJR.org. Yeah, it's just a couple minute break. That's really yeah. interesting about the, me and my dad talk about that all the time, that people yeah. don't really understand like that um, there's like sarcasm involved in a lot of like, yeah, yeah. you know humor and that people don't quite get that nowadays you're not making fun of like the person who what's being sapped you know yeah, what is yeah. it, satirically satirized satirized yeah, satirized. yeah it's yeah. like you're making fun of the people who think that way about those people right, you know yeah, what yeah, i mean yeah. it's like and i feel like that's interesting too is like i think we need comedy clubs and humor and yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean that's that's been a problem for a while i look i do you, do you know bloom county the cartoon no, the only one I can think of is South Park that still kind of does well, that unapologetically. Like, 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 imagine, imagine something that was pitched as high in terms of satire as South Park is, but didn't have the kind of uh, meanness about it, right? So yeah, the characters are all really mean, but they're all friends. They're, they're, yeah, 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 right. Cartney's the kid's but, parents the one time. No, yeah, fuck that. Is. <laughs> And Radiohead helped him. I yeah, he's like, about like you're crying. I'm like, what am I? I cannot see they put this on TV. Um, but um, like one of, one of the characters in there is kind of the cardinal, right? He's like, okay. clearly, this is the obnoxious, horrible, cynical, cruel, whatever. And the guy created the cartoon while he was still a, a student at University of Texas. Oh, really? And so he, the first cartoon. What's it called? Uh, Bloom County. Okay. So this is all this is all the way back in the eighties and nineties. Okay. That's an old one, right? But um, he had this exact problem. They had this kind of what was clearly a satirical mm -hmm. character that you were not supposed to side with, and like all the fraternity guys really liked that character. I thought that was the best <laughs> part about the strip. And he was like, okay, <laughs> I lose, right? So yeah, this this is a, this is an old problem. That's interesting. Uh, people not knowing they are the joke. Kind of That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I got a couple a couple other interesting, interesting topics. But I think it's yeah, interesting you think about it's like the people who don't get like jokes or sarcasm. Like it, yeah, yeah. it's like uh you ever seen Big Bang Theory like Sheldon? Like yeah, yeah. the thing is he can't understand sarcasm and we all like laugh at him and stuff, but it's like how do you understand like like that's the joke yeah. with him is he can't you know he can't understand jokes. He doesn't have social cues. He has a like, very, very, very literal sense of Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. My parents love Big Bang Theory. Um, Have you seen Young Sheldon? It's good. Yes. In fact, they, I, I don't know, there was, a, there was a season arc at one point that Sheldon was becoming a philosophy major. Yes. Right? Yes. And it's because he has this professor and he has this conversation with Descartes. Mm -hmm. And I was watching this and my parents asked me, what do you think about this? And I was like, that's actually really good. Like, that is what Descartes should say there, right? That's exactly right. I thought it was somebody, awesome. Probably. Somebody yeah. actually sat down and got it right. So I was, I, I greatly appreciate that. We are back in the present tense with Sam Stratton, one point seven of them, WJR Washington, online at WNJR. Today we're talking with Dr. Mike Wolf. To start today, we've talked about some topics from his book. So next topic, Dr. Wolf. And I'll read this word for word. I think okay. you know which one I'm going to read. Chapter 34. If you've been scanning titles looking for the entry with all the dirty words, <laughs> this is the one. So, Dr. Wolf. Yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, everyone has maybe said a curse word or two at a time in their life. Why does profanity have a place within language? What does it mean? Why, why uh, is it there? And the FCC, we I just want to clear, the FCC is listening. We don't like profanity right, on here. Right, right, right. But if anyone was to use, you know, profanity in their life, why, why do people use these words? Um, I, I've been accused of using a lot of them. Most most frequently by my mother, the accusations. Really? <laughs> um, I grew up Catholic. My first confession was almost entirely about profanity. Uh, I went in, and he sat down with the priest, and you sort of say, Father, you may have sinned, all this stuff, right? And you're supposed to tell them these terrible things that you've done. And my mother had gotten some complaints back from my basketball coach about some language on the court. Which wasn't even necessarily like me, it, you know. But like my friend had made some improbable shot, and I was like, you know, holy this, that, and the other. I can't have to believe you. You made me. <laughs> uh, that was that was happening awesome or whatever. 
I can like that. We really don't want to do that. So my mom said, well, this could be the thing that you talk about your first confession. I was like, okay, well, that's what I'll do. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, had, we had actually a very good parish priest at the time. And uh, he said, okay, so tell me, tell me about the things that you've done that you think you want to confess here. It's like, wow, well, I have this thing in basketball practice. And I start telling him the story. <laughs> because of course I think this is you know, I think I think confession is a podcast when I'm when I'm a, when I'm a nine year old or whatever. And um I said, Yeah, so my friend made the shot and I said, Holy this, I can't believe it. He's like, stop, 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 stop. He said, You don't actually have to repeat the sins in confession. <laughs> I said, Oh god, I'm really, really sorry. He's like, Ah, it's okay. It would have been worse if it had been murder, right? So that's <laughs> you know, okay, so there's a little joke in confession. Um why do we have profanity? I, th I think it's probably because, um, in, in the broadest possible sense, there are times at which we want intensifiers in our language. And I mean intensifiers in the sense of things that are expressive of greater ranges of emotion than ordinary language is. And I think that trades on the taboo quality of them. Okay, so there are a variety of words that I can't say here on WNJR, right? Um, why? Well, because they're kind of taboo words in the US. If I drop an F-bomb on here, well, this is this will be the last uh, For episode the present last episode of the present day. But which is different than Europe. And you saw, uh, I don't know if you saw this, but Victor went by on it. He went on the TNT interview after the All-Star game and was just and he wasn't saying it trying to be, he was just like, wow, yeah. this was effing crazy. You know what I mean? But then in Europe, yeah. where he was from, it was just. Yeah. Um, and again, I can't say this on the air on WNJR, but uh, what, what is perhaps the most taboo uh, piece of profanity in the US uh, is tossed about much more casually in Australia. Yes, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so we we'll talked about that this summer. We, we will be vague about this. <laughs> if you're interested, hit me up on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We, we, can, we can talk later. Um, but in a sense, I think what's happening there is, well, this, this kind of goes back to the stuff about speech acts that I was talking about, right? When you're actually using a piece of language, there is a degree to which there's a kind of standard set of things that go along with words and sentences. Normal kind of strict semantic meanings, if you like. Okay? But then there's all sorts of ways you can put things to use in, in doing that, right? So, I mean, if you think about any given curse word, uh, it has a non-profane analog, right? Um, and, and again, I can't say a lot of these words on the air, but like, just pick any curse word you like and there's this thing you can say that doesn't have that taboo quality about it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we even have this almost like um, interim version, right? Mm -hmm. So heck is a good example right. of this, right? And so that's a kind of compromise word. It's kind of like, I know that you want to use this modifier, but here's this thing that you can use instead, and that can be a kind of almost truce and meet in the middle kind of thing, right? So I think the, 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 the simple answer about uh, why profane words are profane and why are they offensive, I think it really comes down to nothing more than convention. It's just that you know the F word means something, particularly to Americans, right? Um, again, there is a word beyond that which we won't mention. And that's not the word. But it's kind of a. But those are very much social, cultural conventions. So it's fair to say it's kind of like a built in exclamation point. Like you're really like yeah. meaning what you said. Yeah, yeah. And one of the interesting things is you can use it in lots of different ways. Like, so when I got in trouble for cursing at basketball practice, that was not mean, that was not cruel, that was sort of effusive, joyful, I can't believe you made that shot, right? So the thing you might wanna ask is, okay, so why, if that's so, and why if pretty much everybody drops the occasional, you know, dirty word, as it were, why does anybody think that it's a particularly kind of morally important thing? And here's the thing I would suggest, I think it is about a kind of social scene stealing. Okay? Think about this conversation we're having. Okay? You sort of set this up. I sort of agreed that would be a good idea. I kind of figured you're going to you know, ask the questions. 
I'll talk back, we'll get a little back and forth going. There's a kind of a structure that goes along with this kind of conversation, right. the way this is gonna work in the setting. If you think about how a class runs, that would be a much bigger characteristic of that. If you think about how a night out with your friends might run, it's probably gonna be different from either of those things, right? Either the podcast or the class. There's probably a whole lot more profanity in a night out with your friends there is in either of the first two. Certainly more than we're going to have on tonight's episode of Present Tense. Right. <laughs> um, what happens if I come in and I just drop an F-bomb in the middle of your show? Again, it's your last show. But <laughs> I, I kind of violated the implicit agreement that we had. Right? No, I mean, in this case, it's a much more explicit agreement. Right? Right. We, we knew ahead of time, like, yeah, these are the rules, the FCC will right. go nuts on us and so on and so forth. Right? Um, so it's even more explicit in that case. But I think that's kind of what's happening. That when people are offended by profanity, it's that they don't want to play around with that taboo in that setting. And if I kind of mm -hmm. come in and I drop something unexpectedly, I have, as it were, put them out, socially speaking. Right, that they were kind of proceeding with a certain set of expectations, and I've just barged in and taken over the scene, right? I've taken mm -hmm. over that particular little social arrangement that I've had. So it's not that dropping an F bomb is somehow inherently a problem. It's that many cases in which you do it, and especially if you do it in an especially cruel way to someone, is really kind of raising the level, right? raising that exclamation point quality that you were talking about in a way that is unusually aggressive, right? I'm changing this social setting. I'm putting you out. I'm taking this over and you don't get to do it the way you want to do it, right? It's insulting in some cases. So, so it's kind of like if you're playing basketball with your buddies and you're just messing around, but then you go to walk across the street to a restaurant, like a nice coffee shop or something, and yeah, you yeah. start talking the same way you were on the court. It's, it's gonna feel different. <laughs> Right, I've noticed that um, before too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, like, um, well, and and and, and in, a, in a way, I think this will remind you of some of the things we said about jokes earlier. There are things that I can say in a context where I'm joking with you that would be really out of place elsewhere, with your boss or with my boss or whatever, or or even. Well, I was thinking about this, um, uh, and I, I was thinking, of, and there's a there's also a chapter on slurs. Yeah, I saw that. Book, right? I thought that was a that was can of slurs for the yeah, yeah, radio yeah, show. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we may not cover that one, but you, I mean, you think about a slur, right? Um, people throw slurs around to apply themselves sometimes. Yeah. Right? Why? Well, if you're throwing that around with someone who would be in the same sort of position, you're not really exercising social power over somebody else. Right, so if you know Dr. Osborne and I sit around making jokes about philosophers to each other, we're both philosophers. But if the chemistry guy came in, right, and starts talking that way, then it's all over. <laughs> or you know, I mean, there's ways that my brother gives me a hard time, and I give my brother a hard time, and so on. And you know, I'm sort of free to make fun of him in these ways, and he's free to make fun. Of well, you shared the ways. story where you were like the server for all the great ones. I, 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 will, I will tell you the story of the greatest burn I ever got. <laughs> that, that'll be good radio, right? But if somebody came up and said some of those things to my brother. Well, he's going to meet the floor, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's about to turn ugly if you talk to my brother that way, right? Um, so, you know, um, in, in that sense, right, if we've set up a social, as it were, mini contract, right? We've got a kind of implicit understanding that this is a social setting in which we're going to work things this way, and we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this. Um, and there's this taboo, and we're going to honor that taboo because it might bother some people more than others. And I come in and I just break that. I've kind of scrambled the social setting that we're in. And I've done it in a way that takes power away from someone else. It makes them feel like they don't really count in the setting because I just came in and tossed the rules, as it were. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Now, the next topic. I want well, to hang on. i got to tell about the burn. Are right, you talking about when your brother painted the picture of you? Yes. You said that you told that on here last time. Oh, did I? Yeah, oh, you did. Yeah, okay. That's why I brought up. You told it. Yeah, 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 you told yeah, it on here last yeah, time. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, if I could talk to animals, chapter forty-two. <laughs> my, so, doctor, my doctor do little joke. Yeah. So, like, I know that it, you know certain points in classes, especially like mm -hmm. uh, 
moral ethics and moral theories classes. We've talked about, you know, are human animals included in morality? So, like, mm-hmm. do, do you think animals have emotions? Where do you lie on the, the kind of can animals communicate? I know you're a big cat person. Yeah, yeah. We've so, always had cats, yeah. So, you've had animals around. I mean, yeah, yeah. what's kind of your opinion on the animals' feelings? Like, do we have moral obligation to animals? What's, what's your thought? I, I, well, I, I think we have at least some, some moral obligation to animals, sure. Um, because I, I still think, I mean, you mentioned emotions. I think animals certainly have, at least, you know, a bunch of animals do. Like, my cat does. I can, we can go talk to the animal psychologists about the variety of things in which this would be true. But I certainly think that, you know, my cat has emotions likes having his belly rubbed most of the time until it infuriates him and he attacks me. Um, <laughs> that he's really scared of certain kinds of things and so forth. Right. And I certainly think that animals can suffer. And while I'm not a dive in the wool utilitarian or anything, um, I don't want a world with more suffering. Right? You know, right. I'm, I'm with them that far at least, right? So um, certainly I think there are at least a lot of ways in which we should think of ourselves as having moral obligations to animals. Right? Um, and at the same time, I don't know that I think animals are concept users in the sense that we are. I think they represent their world, I think they navigate it, but I don't think they treat it conceptually like we do. There's no snowball Napoleon and Boxer. <laughs> Great book, by the way, I showed it for the first time. Yeah. But. Uh, my, my cat is not thinking that oh, this human's no good. He won't wake up. Yeah. Like I don't think he's actually thinking. Four that. legs. What is it? Four four legs good. Two legs bad. In the, in the book. In, well, in our in our in our household, whenever we want to sort of joke about the cat talking about us, he always refers to us as two layers. <laughs> so you know, it's like, hey, what are you doing? With me? You're completely wasting those two arms, right? Um, and I don't think uh, uh, animals are language users in anything like the same sense. Okay. And that is drawn a pretty high bar, I will admit. That's not an uncontroversial claim. So even like, because I read a book on birds one time, it's like yeah. birds kind of have these like um, warning calls, very in-depth yeah. warning system. So yeah. that's not language. I don't think that's a language, strictly speaking. Okay, just a... I th- well, because when I talk about a language, and again, this is to draw a high bar. Okay, okay right? no, that's... Um, I think you're talking about a language when you're talking about something that has a grammar and a syntactical structure. Like you have to have that. Mm. You have to have a set of rules that govern it. It has to have recombinability. It has to have <clears throat> a kind of systematic structure. It has to be the case that you can recombine it in novel ways. That you can do that in potentially infinitely many new ways. So, so you, that's where the bird, like warning calls, mating calls, playful sounds, like. You can't recombine them. And... Right. And, and so lots of animals have a variety of calls. I mean, you just want to talk about my cat. He hisses at me when he's angry and <laughs> purrs when he's happy. You know, mm-hmm. think, right? um, and lots and lots and lots of birds, for instance, have tons of even more specific calls. There are all these interesting things about, uh, I, I guarantee you I'm going to screw this up, um, different varieties of the same species of bird can learn the calls of the different varieties in many cases, mm-hmm. right? But if you put those birds with other species of birds, they don't learn anything at all, mm-hmm. right? So it's almost as though if you're looking at a particular species of bird and there are different varieties of it, it's almost like they have different accents. Yeah, funny, I said a bird with a southern accent yeah. or something. <laughs> Caw, I said, <laughs> Caw. <laughs> um, but you know, if you put them with a completely different species, they, they don't even recognize that those are calls. So they're just further noises okay. in the environment, right? Um, so, um, and this, this gets controversial, for instance, uh, and maybe, maybe you're thinking of this, uh, this one too, but uh, is, is that the entry that's got the stuff about chimps? Maybe? It might be, it might be, anyways. There is an episode, there is an entry in the book about um, sort of chimp languages, and I think this is a little bit more far removed, but we've probably heard stories about like Coco the chimp, who learned sign language, and all these kinds of things, right? And there was sort of great enthusiasm about enthusiasm about this in the 1970s. They, like you put a chimp, and he would write like a thousand-page novel if you left him in there for a thousand years. If you just let him bag away at the typewriter, and you know they got nothing else to do, eventually they'll write you at least a short story. Um, but yeah, I mean, like in the 70s, there was this thought: well, you know, the the the, the chimps and the gorillas can't vocalize. Right? I said Coco was a chimp. I think Coco was a gorilla. I misspoke. Sorry. Um, 
they, they can't vocalize. They don't have just the sort of auditory hardware uh, in order to be able to do something like that. They don't have the stuff in their throat that would kind of do that. But they have, you know, roughly as good motor control as we do. So maybe we could teach them to sign. That was a thought by a bunch of researchers back in the 60s and 70s. And there was all this excitement because they could teach them a bunch of signs and they would sort of do them and recombine them. It's like, hey, we're talking to other primates. We've broken through. We've figured out how to, you know, uh, you know, actually use a language that the chimps can speak just as well as we can. Uh, I dated a woman in college who was very, very enthusiastic about this. And so when I would say things like, yeah, I don't think the animals are talking to you, would be like, oh, duh, 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 duh. what about Coco? Would Coco do this, that, and the other? Right? Part of the thing that you find out about a number of these studies is that they weren't really scientifically reproducible, mm -hmm. right? So we, they're also troubling in that a great deal of the information that went into saying, oh, the chimps are using sign language was coded by very, very small teams of people mm. who were especially susceptible to kind of throwing out things that they didn't want and emphasizing things that they did, okay? So, um, I call, call me a skeptic about those kinds of, of studies and so forth. One of the things that sort of comes out if you look more closely at the data is it never really seems that the chimps and gorillas are doing anything that is not immediately present before them and about some kind of action or satisfaction, right? So they'll make signs when they want to get fed, or they'll make signs when they want somebody to you know, get away from them, mm -hmm. or something like that. But they won't recombine in systematic ways. They won't take signs and do things, right? So I mean, there was um, uh, there was a famous example with uh, was it, it might have been with Coco, or it might have been with one of the others, right? Um, where they, they were, so, uh, this seems sort of crazy to me. This seems like how you die as a primatologist. But one of the things that they were doing was kind of sort of trying to poke and annoy and agitate the chimpanzee a little bit. And again, I think this is how you get killed as a primatologist. Well, because then they, they attacked a guy who didn't give one of them a birthday cake one time. Like yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're, they're big, dangerous animals. So <laughs> yeah. don't, don't do this, right? But, um, you know, the, the primate in question, again, I, I don't remember if it was Coco or someone else. Um, uh, did this thing where it pointed to its butt and then it pointed to its face and then it pointed to the trainer. <laughs> um, and they were like, it's learned how to insult people. It says that you're a butt face or, you know, whatever. <laughs> whatever I could say on WNJR at this hour of the night, right? Um, and so we're like, well, did it keep calling you a butt face later when you did annoying things? Did it say, what is the nature of butt faces? No, it didn't do any of that, right? So, you know, Maybe it was telling you something else, right? Here's the problem, you have underdetermination. Maybe what it was telling you was, I'm gonna put you in my butt. I'm gonna put your face in my butt You keep doing this. You pick something else as an interpretation. How did you pick that interpretation? You don't have a syntax about how it uses those signs that will let you say, ah, this is what it's actually doing, right? You just have a series of signs and you're making up an interpretation for it. So. People are always a little disappointed when I tell them this. That I, don't, I don't think chimps are talking to us. I don't think the chimps are very good concept users either. Right? One of the interesting things that I think most animals lack when it comes to language use is social skills. Right? Um, and you might say, well, lots of animals live in herds. Lots of animals you know, sort of do things together. Isn't that social? Well, but what I mean is very, very few animals seem to have really significant what psychologists would call theory of mind, okay? So for instance, as I'm sitting here and I'm talking to you, one of the things that I'm doing is imagining what you're thinking, right? <laughs> and one of the things that you're doing as I'm talking to you is you're imagining what I'm thinking, right? So both of us have a pretty special social skill in that way. Humans have it in general, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that it's possible for us to kind of project the kinds of states and experiences that we have onto other beings that are having those states and experiences. So I do this all the time with you, and I actually do it productively, and with other people, and so forth. Uh, and I sort of jokingly do this with my cat, but I think my cat, it's kind of a one-way street with him, mm -hmm. right? I don't think he's doing it back in the same way, okay? So, there's another entry in the book where I talk about this with sort of primate research and, and so forth. And it seems as though 
chimps and maybe some other primates have a degree of theory of mind, right? But it's mostly about perception as opposed to reflective awareness. So if, you know, we got a chimp over here and a chimp over here, and there's some food over here, this chimp can look at that chimp and kind of recognize that it's looking at the food, right? It can imagine its perceptions, and it can probably guess that that thing's gonna run over and, you know, try to grab it, right? But it's not clear that it can do something like think, aha, he is aware of that food, mm -hmm. and I must, I must grab it before he does, right? I must distract him before I get a, you know, he gets a chance to do something. There doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence to support that kind of next level of social skills. And that seems to be really, really closely tied to a full-blooded kind of language as opposed to a series of calls, right? So tons of animals have calls, right? They make noises. My cat hisses at the postal carrier because he doesn't like any kind of noise in the house. Um, and cats that would hiss at vacuum cleaners and so on. Uh, and, you know, cats certainly hiss back and forth to each other, bird calls, and so on and so forth, but nothing with the kind of structure that you see in human natural languages. Now, moving from real animals to, some would say, a not real animal and a unicorn chapter, <laughs> um, what is the idea behind the chapter, could there be unicorns? Here's a question. Um, how do you introduce a kind term into a language, okay? Now, kind term is sort of what it sounds like. It's a word that stands for a kind of thing, okay? So there can be social kind terms. How do those come into being? Well, we have social conventions and practices and so forth. How do you get to be a podcast host? Well, there's this practice of hosting podcasts, and you signed up, and now you're a podcast host. So there you go. Um, how do we get kind terms for things that are supposed to be part of the natural world, like water, for instance? Hmm. Um, one theory that had a lot of traction for a lot of the 20th century was that kind terms were cluster terms. So I could take a kind term and I could unpack it into a cluster of things that were implicit within it. So if I talk about my cat, well, my cat is a furry, quadruped mammal, sleeps 23 hours a day, uh, complains the, the other hour, you know, like whatever goes into being a cat, right? That, that you know, the word cat was just this sort of suitcase holding all of these simpler kinds of terms, mm -hmm. okay? And that seems a little tricky because, well, to take another term like water, for instance, if you ask chemists in 1750, what is water, right? They'll tell you a certain kind of scientific story. It is a simple substance which has no microstructural parts. Right? It's just continuous all the way down. It dissolves things, has all these other properties and so forth, right? And so you get that, as it were, cluster. Okay? If you ask chemists in 1850, they'll tell you just the opposite about a bunch of that. That there are microstructural parts of water, right? Little H2O molecules and so forth. Um, so does that mean that they can't talk to each other, right? If they're just using completely different words? Well, surely they can. I mean, the chemists in 1850 are saying like, yeah, those chemists in 1750 were wrong about water. And they're totally barking up the wrong tree, mm -hmm. right? So, it doesn't seem like a kind term can be just that sort of fixed cluster of things. Right. Because over time, we've said very, very different things about what water is. I see. So, right? So here's another idea that comes along, right? This starts in particular in the 1970s with, I'll, I'll say three philosophers, um, Saul Kripke, Hilary Putnam, and Ruth Bark and Marcus. Okay? Ruth Bark and Marcus often, often gets left out of this conversation, but I think she deserves some credit too, right? What they said is, no, 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 when we introduce natural kind terms, what we do is just sort of point to something in the world and say, we're going to call that water. What is it? I don't know. We'll figure it out. Okay? But that sort of fixes the reference, even though I can't tell you everything that's going to be true about it later on. Okay? So in a sense, what they wanted to do was they wanted to treat 
those particular words almost as though they were just pointing to something. Like they don't really have a whole lot of meaning to unpack. It just kind of comes down to, yeah, that stuff. That's, that stuff in the lake, right? That's water, that's it, right? Um, so if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Think now about what makes a unicorn. It's a horse with a horn that flies. Horse with a horn, does it, can, can it fly? Okay, well, maybe, maybe it has wings. Maybe, maybe in some versions it can. Okay. <laughs> At any rate, right? Um, and it's supposed to be associated with like chivalry and honor yeah. and, and all that stuff, right? Um, so I would go so far as to say there haven't actually been any unicorns in the world, right? This is something from stories, okay? So how do we get the word unicorn? Well, we get it from those stories. It's not something that we actually put you like, yeah, there goes one. There they are, running over the hill, right? Or flying over the hill, maybe, right? Uh, that never happened because there were never actually any unicorns. You might be on some substances if you saw that. Right, right. You, you may have had a little too many of the funny mushrooms in the forest <laughs> if you and your medieval compatriots are saying like, yeah, I think they're actually <laughs> Don't do drugs, kids. Um, so there, there have never actually been any unicorns in the world. Let's just say that for mm -hmm. a moment, right? Well, you know, let's imagine that um, we got a bunch of biomedical engineers and they go a little bit crazy with the CRISPR editing, right? With the gene editing and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, hey, you know, we can make a horse with a horn that comes out of its head, right? Maybe they've done a couple of substances, which again, don't do drugs, kids. Um, and they're like, hey, let's, let's, let's make some unicorns, man. Let's, let's get a little crazy with the DNA and just you know, have a horn coming out of the horse's head. And so suppose we start making horned horses, right? Um, are those unicorns? Yes. You want to say yes, right? Those three philosophers I mentioned want to say no. That they are unicorn-like, but they're not actually unicorns. Because what is an actual unicorn? Where do we actually get the meaning of that word? It's fictional. It's the thing from the story, right? Or the stories and legends and so forth, okay? So we can make something that kind of looks like it, but it's not the thing that we were talking about. Interesting. Right? Um, and that, that, that's a hard sell, right? Because yeah. you kind of think like, if I actually saw a horn coming out of a horse's head, it's white, maybe, I don't know, if, we, if the scientists can grow the wings, great, fantastic. Mm -hmm. This will be great use of NIH money. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I might be kind of saying, okay, again, maybe we do have unicorns now, right? These other philosophers I'm talking about would starkly disagree, right? They say, that's just not what the word means. It's tied to this other thing. That's the only way we could have gotten the word because there was never an actual unicorn when we acquired the word that we could point to and say that thing okay so there can be things that are unicorn like but strictly speaking they want to say they're not unicorns interesting i tried to figure out um like a story to tell to kind of motivate this in the book and what i ended up talking about was uh, somebody that i met when i was in graduate school okay and I went to graduate school at Georgetown, or in the hoodie tonight, not that your listeners can see this. Um, and one of the things that we had there was what are called under-over classes. So there would be a class, and you could register for that class as a graduate student, or you could register for that class if you were an undergraduate student. If you were an undergraduate student, they gave the course one number. If you were a graduate student, they gave a different number. Right? And usually there was a difference in the work that you did, like the graduate student had to write more papers or longer papers or something, right? Um, so there's this guy who was in the class, and um, uh, I, I was sort of surprised by him because we'd be in there, and he would sort of blurt out things at inappropriate times. Like we'd be talking about some point, or you know, the professor would be talking about some point, and all of a sudden he would just kind of jump in with an idea. Um, and at some point the professor kind of had to talk him down. About this and I was telling my friend um, the, the story of this guy who's in the class he was like I know who that is I was like okay and both my friend and I were teaching assistants so mm -hmm. we would grade all the stuff for these big classes and so forth and he said I know that guy because he was in the intro class that I was a teaching assistant for last semester I think there were it was something like there were 75 students in that class 
And he said, that guy was 75th in grade, in grade three. But something about philosophy just flipped that switch for him. He's like, I want to be a philosophy professor. And you know, at the time, I'm a graduate student. I'm thinking about the uphill climb I have to ever work in this field. And I'm like, dude, I, I really don't think this is going to work out for you. But I'm not going to tell him that, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to be stepping on somebody else's dream. But the weird thing about it was uh, he, he, he really came to love this idea of being a philosophy professor. And so he started to kind of do philosophy professor things, but like stereotypical philosophy professor things. So he started wearing like old suits Right, so you know he would get like the you know corduroy jacket with leather patches, and <laughs> he got a pipe. No, he did not. He did. I am not making this up, right? <laughs> and you know he would sit out in the quad, out in front of the you know, classes as people were going in, and he would just sort of. I mean, I, I can't really do this on the radio, but he, he would sit there in a posture of like, yes, yes, tell me more. Like Opp like Oppenheimer did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like he, he looked like Oppenheimer in that way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that's true. He looked very much like Oppenheimer, right? And he'd always be kind of wagging the pike back and forth with this, yes, yes, interesting point, sir, kind of thing, right? It was as though some, it was like he was cosplaying a philosophy professor, but a, cosplaying a philosophy professor from the 1930s. <laughs> something like something you would see in an old movie or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, I sort of thought, well, there are a number of things wrong with this. One, I'm going to be a philosophy professor, and I look like a roadie for a heavy metal band. And I still do, honestly, <laughs> for, for telling the truth here. Um, none of this is actually what's important with being a philosophy professor, right? All of these are just kind of superficial qualities, in other words. But I have to admit, he did look like a philosophy professor from the 1930s. So he was very philosophy professor-like, but he was not actually a philosophy professor. Being a philosophy professor would have involved something else. I see. If the scientists go crazy with the DNA editing and start making white horses with horns coming out of their heads, they're going to be very, very unicorn-like at the very least. Right? But if we get the meaning of the word unicorn in a certain way, and those are always going to be fictional, you can't really be one of those things. Mm. Right? If I dress up like a stormtrooper because I really, really, really love Star Wars, I look kind of like a stormtrooper, but I'm not really like part of the Imperial Guard or anything. I don't really work for Darth Vader. Right. I don't. Which is like the worst gig ever. It's yeah, like yeah seriously. Right? Like, yeah. Uh, at least you don't have to spend a lot of time in target practice. Right? Yeah. There are very, very low requirements right. for marksmanship. Yeah. Kind of thing. yeah, yeah. Um, like I can dress up like a stormtrooper, but I will never actually be a stormtrooper because that's just a fictional thing. It's just a different kind of beast. Interesting. Well, right? Uh, so that's that's kind of why they think there can't really be unicorns, even if we end up with weird looking horses. Now, one more kind of topic before we talk a little baseball and wrap okay. up tonight. Okay. And I know that you could probably talk about this for hours, but if we can keep it to the to the short version, just because well, I, I do want to get to baseball. But this isn't really the book. But you talked about John Coltrane a lot when you yeah. came on your last time. Music and you know, watching some guitar videos and kind of learning guitar, I've, I've heard people use the. The term like your solo needs to have emotion, your solo needs to tell a story, it needs yeah, to have yeah. a resolution. So is language I'm sorry, is music a language, you know? And then some way that someone someone mm -hmm. might get you fired up with words, like the way would you listen to like maybe a perfect heavy metal solo or a rapper rap mm -hmm. over a beat or a jazz musician you know, kind of just going over a sixteen bar solo and they're just perfect. Is I've, it I've, language I've, is I've, language? I've had my heart broken by one note. You know, just the right note at the right time, like uh oh. Uh, uh. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm very much with you on the emotive quality of it. I think that's okay. absolutely true. And um, I think, I don't know if I want to say that it is a language. Um, I think it's language like. Well, there's a philosophy distinction in there. <laughs> uh, there. There are important ways in which it's very, very similar, but I'll hold off on saying that it's exactly the same, right? Um, okay. And I think... Um, Even though it can be restructured and recombined? Well, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, I think... I, I think a lot about music theory. 
this is a thing that I do at home when I've got nothing else to do, right? Uh, and I try to write things that are theoretically interesting, right? That do interesting novel things, kind of inspired by the musicians that I love and so forth. And I've learned a certain kind of theory for doing that. I, I know how my minor chords work, I know what my subtonics and my dominants are, and all, all the stuff that you learn in the first two years of music school. Um, I've learned this very, very, very slowly. <laughs> I should have just gone to music school or whatever. Um, but I also think that, you know, that's one particular frame for doing it, mm -hmm. right? I don't know that that has to be the only way in which you do it. Mm -hmm. and so, I mean, sometimes people are too dismissive. It, it's a cool way to do things and it opens up all kinds of possibilities. But I don't know that those are the only possibilities, or that those are inherently better possibilities, or that everybody needs to catch up and learn about their topics and their subdominance and so forth. Um, so, in the sense that I think the language that I'm speaking really does have a grammar to it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that all music has to have a grammar in the same way. That's true. Right? Um, but, at the, but at the same time, I think. I, I would bet you anything that the parts of the brain that do a lot of work on language can do a lot of work with music too. Um, and I think there's a reason that we call it phrasing when you're playing a solo, right? There's something about the way in which people's attention and uh, how long you play something and how different things evoke emotion can have the same kinds of qualities as reading good poetry or you know, an honest talk with somebody or something like that. So I'm not convinced that, I'm not convinced that it's exactly the same as language. It's, it's interestingly, informatively, importantly similar. I'll say that. Okay. Um, and I think um, it, it's, it, it strikes me that way one of the things is that I've, I've, I've done a lot of things with music for a long time. I mean, I've, I've done some kind of music as much as I could for, you know, 35 years. I don't even know how long, something like that, since, since I was a teenager. Right? Um, and each time I kind of think I've got it figured out, I, I sort of realize, like, oh, I just had this little bit of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I remember when uh, I first started I first started playing and somebody explained you know the basics of the notes and what makes a key and I was like okay I got it right so now I can just play with this whatever and then I started to start to figure out like oh yeah all these songs have similar patterns in them why do they have those patterns right why do you always go from the one chord to the four chord or whatever it's like oh you're going from your tonic to your subtonic right? um, it's like okay now I've got it figured out you know and then I started learning about you know, even more complicated kinds of things, like modes, and how to mix your modes, and how to borrow chords, and it's like, now, now I'm kind of here. Um, and the longer and the more I do of it, the more I'm like, I really have almost never had any idea. <laughs> like, like each time, like even though I remember all that stuff, each time I kind of learn something, I'm like, oh, there's another thing to open up here. Um, so one of the things I've worried a lot about um, in trying to write music in the last few years has been voicings. I finally got myself a keyboard, and you can do a lot of different voicings of a chord. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about a C chord, it's got to have a C, C major chord, right? It's got to have a C, an E, a G in it. Mm -hmm. Can you extend it? Can you add like a B or a B flat as a seventh? Can mm -hmm. you add, you know, um, you know, a D and make it a ninth or whatever? Um, you know, twenty-five-year-old music nerd Michael can tell you, oh, that's a C at nine chord. I know what that is. Mm -hmm. thing, right? Um, Michael today can kind of sit here and think like, which version of this C chord does the thing that I want to happen as I'm trying to write this part of this song, right? If I'm trying to write this song, it's got a certain kind of emotional thread running through it, but this is about grief, or this is about uh, the comfort of someone who cares about you, or this is about the anger that I feel about something, right? What version of putting these things together does that right here? Right? So in that sense, again, the interesting parallels, I think about that as a writer mm -hmm. as well, right? I know what the words mean, I know how the sentences go, but I also kind of get 
that careful choices are more powerfully expressive than some of the things that I used to write. Right? And so I keep learning as a writer. I keep learning as someone writing music, right? Um, in that sense, I don't know that they're the same thing, but they are so interestingly parallel that they kind of get me excited in very, very comparable ways. Wow, awesome answer. And like I said, I do want to ask you some baseball questions. So okay. we've had some big free agent signings, so obviously, for your Orioles and Radley, Corbin Burns, yeah, yeah, that's Orioles. Right. But, you know, well, that, was, that, was a, that was a trade, but still, yeah. A trade, yes. Yeah. Um, one, one, Juan Soto, one year, thirty-one million dollar deal with the Yankees. Show Tani, ten year, one seven hundred million dollar deal right. with the Dodgers. Um, they have signed a pitcher from Japan. I don't know how to pronounce his name, and I don't remember it. So Yoshinibu Yamoto. Yamamoto. Yamamoto. Yeah. Yamamoto. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, which free agent signings have stood out to you? Um, I mean, those are the well, two I, big ones. But yeah, yeah sure, sure. Um, <laughs> And obviously, I'm um, I'm excited about the move for the Orioles, right? That this is the first time they've had kind of a, a a genuine kind of number one starter since Mike Bucina went to the American League team from New York in 2000, right? Which broke my heart, but whatever. Um, it's fine. It's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping for great things from him, right? And that's certainly a very, very smart move. That was a thing that they needed to do and that they managed to do that. I am really astonished by the Otani money. Hmm. Like the, the, the 70 million. And admittedly, he's got it structured in this funny way that he's really only getting, what is it, like a... I believe it's 2 million. Yeah, 2 million a year for the, for the 10 years, but then he gets... <laughs> 680 million. 680 million across the you know rest of the 20 before tax before taxes right <laughs> well yeah yeah but, but I mean I'm not sure if he's I'm not sure how that works if he is a citizen of Japan who Ooh. is yeah I don't know I, I, I genuinely don't know that he's gonna be very rich regardless he is that's for sure and I mean I think you know the the argument has been that uh, the the value that he brings to a team goes beyond what he does on the field. Mm -hmm. There's a way in which Japanese baseball has wanted legitimacy for a long time. It's been very, very hard for even the best players to kind of come over. A lot of things have changed, right? There's a lot more money in Japanese baseball. The top players in some cases don't want to come to the MLB because right. they can make really, really good money. And, and Obviously, you see the Samurai Japan team beat USA. Right, no. yeah, yeah. Uh, and they, but they can make really, really good money in the MPB, right? But I think, I think what they're sort of thinking is that Yamamoto and Otani kind of make them a global team, right? Mm. This is a kind of branding thing in the way that, you know, some European soccer teams can kind of claim this, right? There's an important way in which, um, uh, well, Real Madrid or... Right. Barcelona. Well, even uh, the Miami team with Messi now, right, yeah. or like Luca and Dirk have both played from you know the European guys. Dirk kind of was, you know, I feel like he kind of made the Mavs Germans favorite team. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, and and it's you know even if um, even if you hate German players and you, you can't stand Dirk Nowitzki, it still means that you're paying attention to the NBA, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think there's a way in which what Los Angeles is thinking about him is regardless of what he does the next 10 years, and I don't think he'll be able to pitch this year um, at the very least, um, uh, the way in which he sort of changes their profile as an organization is what the $700 million is really about. Um, Interesting point. I mean, I think they will probably make back most or all of that just in merchandise, just the yeah. number of Otani jerseys that they could sell or whatever. Well, in Japan and in the States. Exactly, right? So, so it's, it's sort of a funny thing. It's almost like the, the, the baseball matters less in his signing than the kind of cultural tentpole. Well, he's also like a rock star right now, even in, yeah, you know. very much so, yeah. His young career. Yeah. I mean, he, I'm, I, I keep saying this like he's not good. I mean, right, he's, he's <laughs> obviously. He's good, but, you know. Um, it's interesting. I think it's an interesting point to consider, though, too. It's like, yeah. does make maybe the Dodgers the first global baseball team? And there's been a lot of international players before, but yeah. not, I don't think there's been a. We've never seen a player like Otani before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So and you know someone who's probably as popular as a tight end. Just what yeah. he does, pitching, hitting. He's honestly, we've never seen someone kind of like with a body like him in baseball before. Honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. he can do what he does statistically and with his velo, yeah, yeah. his power. I, it's I, like I, he created a video game character. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I mean, they, they keep comparing him to Babe Ruth. And I, I'm always. When, when Babe Ruth was like slamming like 10 hot dogs before a game. Right, right. And, like, and, and just had this kind of bizarre strength. Like he's like, like people yeah. always talk about this, and he has the heaviest bat that he made. Like he had a yeah. forty-four. It's not like he was ever lifting or anything. Yeah, 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 just just this sort of genetic oddity in a way. Uh, I know they did some. I mean, this is the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties, so I don't know how seriously we take the testing, but they did some testing on him and said that he had sort of eyesight and reaction time that just didn't compare with anybody else. Really. Right, so I mean, he could have this sort of ridiculously heavy bat and not a lot of leg strength. Like when you watch film of Babe Ruth hit, none of that's coming from his legs. His big like arm, because when he swings and misses, he's kind of like falling over. Yeah, and yeah, stuff. yeah. So he he doesn't look like a well disciplined hitter at this time. Right. Just sort of think like, imagine you sat down with that guy in a trainer. <laughs> like, how how much longer would he have been able to go? What would he have been able to do? But yeah, I mean, like they keep comparing him with, with Babe Ruth in that way. And Babe Ruth was so statistically just out of bounds uh, relative to his own era. That's that's probably the best comparison. And he, yeah. He's the last person to have that level of success, yes. um, and, and at both pitching and hitting. But at the time, he was no designated hitter, so they switch him over to playing the outfield because the sixty home runs were worth more than. How many games he would have pitched. Right. Yeah. I think the early baseball tests were really interesting. That I have Jim like driving a motorcycle, and then the Bob, another one was yeah, the Bob Feller test. Yeah, they didn't believe like a true curveball existed. So like in the early days, they like set up a pole and something. It was, like, oh, yeah, yeah. I believe that ball does not go over that. You know what I mean? <laughs> that piece of wood. It's really interesting. And so a, kind of a, a dual question here: Who's a dark horse team for you this year? Um, you know, the odds are out on the World Series this uh -huh. year. Dodgers are favored. Braves, Astros, and that order. You know, the Braves side, Chris Hale, which I think was a good pickup. But Dr. Wolf, who's a dark horse team for you, and who's your World Series prediction? I'm gonna go. I'm actually gonna go Braves Orioles. My dark horse team. Uh -huh. I, I guess I could say the Orioles because I feel like you know they're not in the top five in the odds right now. Yeah, yeah, Would you qualify yeah. them as a dark horse team? I don't know. I mean, a lot of people have said the best team in the American League, but you've got this sort of imbalance. And the Braves have been so good and have. And, that, and that's really about core members as opposed to... Yeah. You know, kind of I think because people haven't seen the Orioles maybe do it yet. There's, yeah, a, thing, there's, exactly. there's a difference between potential and actually doing it. Yeah, yeah. So maybe, yeah. That's, maybe that's not fair to say Dark Horse, but... And, and obviously, I, 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 I think in that way, you've got a kind of imbalance um, that um, uh, the, the, the Dodgers and the Braves are so much better than the rest of their league that I think they're going to run away with it. We'll see. The Phillies have got the Braves the past two years. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and I, I, I'm sort of torn about this, right? I mean, the, the sort of more playoff series you have, the more kind of weird things. So Dr. Clip said as well. It's like you let more teams in. And weird things happen. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm obviously frustrated by the Orioles getting swept uh, this year. First time they got swept in, what, a year and a half? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was sort of watching that series and like, yeah, it's, it's this is how it happens when you get swept. There's just a day when you do something stupid and you beat yourself and then there's a day when um, you know just the coin flip goes somebody else's way uh, and then you know but by, by that point it's just about over um, so so to get back to the dark horse thing right and I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna think about the American League here because um, I, I just know it better than the National League is what it comes down to so I, I don't I, I, I don't think the American League team from New York is going to be significantly better. Um, I think even picking up Juan Soto, I, don't, I think they've got too many problems, too many places. Mm -hmm. um, I think Boston is in a weird limbo, so I don't think they're going anywhere. I think Tampa's on the way down at the moment. I mean, they've traded away too many pitchers. McClanahan won't be back. So I agree, yeah. Kind of really serve them well. So I, I do think the Orioles will win the American League East. I'll go ahead and make that prediction. I agree with that, yeah. yeah. And, I, you know, I think about the Central. The Central seems like the weakest division in baseball to me, so I think the Twins probably get away with it again. 
Um, I don't think Cleveland has gotten better in a way that dramatically changes the shape of things there. Uh, when I think about the American League West, you know, it, it, it's hard not to think that it'll be Houston and Texas. So if I'm trying to think about... Um, Maybe the Mariners could be a good dark horse team. Yeah, I was, I was starting to wonder that, right? I mean, I, obviously, Oakland is a strange rolling catastrophe yeah, at this so. point. I, I, I don't even understand what that's about anymore. So yeah, the Mariners might be a good American League team, right? I don't think anybody in the East is going to be all that surprising. I don't think anybody in the Central is going to be all that surprising. I think Seattle is the one team that yeah. sort of has enough talent that they could kind of squeak in. So they, they, they might have, you know, the, just the ball bounced their way a few times. Yeah. So if I were to think about a, a surprising American League team, I would think about Seattle. Yeah, that's a good one. If I were thinking about a surprising National League team, I want to say, um, I, I think the Mets are going to be a mess. I think the Braves. I was going to say maybe the Mets, but I think they're going to be a mess as well. Yeah, I, I think the. Maybe the Phillies again, because I feel like. But, but, but well, I made that comment last time I was but, up here. Yeah, right? Dr. Uh, Clitz, you know, about the Wolverines and the. 26 Wolverines trapped in a bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I think in some sense, they are kind of weird and chaotic enough that it's very, very hard to predict what they're going to do. So they did better than I thought. That's been the past couple years, right? Yeah, yeah. But, I, you know, that kind of chaos comes back to bite you, too, sometimes. So I. I, I, I I don't think that they'll do except exceptionally well this year. Again, they, they, they might play well enough to get in and maybe they'll get lucky and uh, frustrate their brains again, but you know, <laughs> can happen, right? Um, I If I were gonna pick a dark horse team in um, in the uh, National League, it would either be Arizona, again, figuring out some way to do interesting things, or Cincinnati. They've had a good. They've had a few good moves this off season. Right, right. I, 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 that seems to me, you know, a team that's actually sort of shifting into a different gear. I don't think they'll be a great team, but I can imagine them being kind of a wild card. Contender. Well, they're in kind of a weak division too. You know? Also helpful. <laughs> so, Doctor Wolf, couple just a couple things before we get to the core of the day. My first okay. point, and then we'll get to trivia. Then core of the day is, if you could change one rule about baseball right now, <laughs> what would you choose? Uh, if I could change one rule about baseball, um, I, th I think I'm the exceptional party in that I'm, I'm glad with the hurry up and do it rules. <laughs> yeah, um, Dark, I, I think, I, I, see, I don't feel like you're a minority. I think most yeah, people like the pitch clock. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do think that's an improvement. It's changed enough this year that I'm, I'm sort of startled by it. Found the under three I, hours for professional yeah, baseball. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I might, I might give pitchers one more throw over to first. That changed a lot too. You saw the stolen. Yeah. You know, you saw Acuna put up those crazy stolen yeah, base yeah, yeah. numbers this year. And and I mean, in a, in a way, I think they like people moving around, so I don't think they're likely to make that change. But in that sense, it also ceased to be quite as thrilling, right? Because mm -hmm. I mean, if you kind of know that Acuna's going, or um, well, especially after two pickoffs, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I might give them one more. I, so so I'm actually I'm actually happier with the rules than I was years ago. I really. Um, I, I I do not miss the uh, how long can we hit foul balls aspect of things. That just everybody having a fifteen pitch at bat and <laughs> starters going three and a third innings or whatever. I've, I've I've heard some rumbles about sort of they're, they're trying to introduce some rules to kind of keep starters in games longer. See, I, I talked about that. I haven't heard that, but I thought it'd be a good idea because the thing is, a major league game will still take. They get five non-change pitching visits, obviously. Like, yeah, yeah. But the pitching changes takes, especially if it's like one batter in the middle of it. Oh, yeah, well, okay. that, that's a thought. I've, I've had this thought in the past. Um, uh, and, and you just reminded me of this. I should have said this first. Um, I would be in favor of a rule that included no warm-up pitches for, for pitching changes. That's controversial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be good. But, but the, the point being, they can come in when they're actually ready to go. But uh, there's that whole thing with that. See, I'm a pitcher. I'm aware with it. The game mound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you will put better mounds in the in the in the bullpen. Like, I think the MLB PA would be. I, I think no. Nobody's gonna let me do this. Like, <laughs> in an ideal world, in, in the best of all possible worlds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, 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 but I, I do think that if you could speed that, that up. That would cut down a lot of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and um, that that's something that I would find frustrating. 
Yeah. And get a cart, like in the Japanese, like they had a cart, you know. <laughs> they, they used to have a lot more of that in MLB. When I, when I was a kid, there were more golf carts uh, in, in MLB. Well, but, anyway, it, it, was, it was an amusing thing when I was a kid, that just all of a sudden out of nowhere there would be this cart and we kind of you know zip out of the bullpen. And <laughs> the pitcher would be in there, and you'd be like, "I'm gonna ride that thing." Uh, so maybe, there's my really really controversial thing for the night: no no warm up pitches and a pitching change. You come in when you're ready to go, uh, but you get to use the cart. You okay, get to use the cart. sounds good. <laughs> now, Doctor Wolf, of course, we haven't done trivia yet, so do trivia and then the quote of the day. Okay. What Baltimore manager was ejected from the most amount of games? Earl Weaver. That's correct. Did you know once? I knew you were probably going to get that, but I just want to say he was ejected from two games in a doubleheader. Yes. <laughs> that is crazy. That is <laughs> very consistent. Yeah. Yes. Now, when I, when I was a kid, the early we was managing. Um, this was just part of what we would watch the games for. It's like, is he going to do it? Is he going to come out? Is he going to be great? Um, I mean, there's a degree to which Baltimore has this kind of underdog, and Pittsburgh got a bit of this too, right? Mm -hmm. This kind of underdog city, and so somebody who would come out and, you know, not take any, any guff from anybody kind of thing, and uh, would really, really pitch a fit at something you thought was unfair, <laughs> you know, people like that. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know if my parents thought it was a great role model for me or anything, but, you know, like they, <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 I just enjoyed her role, you know. And, 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 I mean, he, he was way ahead of the curve, no pun intended, <laughs> um, uh, in, in thinking very strategically, right? Thinking, you, knowing stats and knowing, okay, what's the best matchup here? Who's well, he's kind of constantly tossed team. around as one of those managers that you have to talk about. And there's so many managers, hard to say, like, greatest of all time. But yeah, yeah. if you're talking about influential managers, managers really have to impact on the game or yeah, yeah. up there. Most valuable thing you have is outs. If you give them up. Throwing away the most valuable thing, you know. Is that a quote from him? Yeah, yeah. He, like he almost never bunted, mm. um, or he almost never had his players bunt, yeah. uh, because he kind of said like, "You've given up and out, and all you've done is gotten somebody to second base." Like, you know, I'd rather they stole, right? Your odds are better there because yeah. you know your best base dealers will you know, at least two thirds of the time. Right, and that's not the case with the bunt. Right, the bunt you're almost always going to get an out, right? So you, mm. he he would let some people steal, but I, I remember. Just years, I never ever saw anybody bunt. Um, That's great. <laughs> yeah. um, he was a great believer in just you know like wear the pitchers down and you know win with a three run home run kind of thing. Whenever there's a three run home run, my parents text me. It's like it's an Earl Weaver special. Or <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, Doctor Wolf, you brought a great quote of the day last time talking about getting rid of bad philosophy. I've, I've got one that combines my interests of both uh, writing and. Um, philosophy, it's from uh, Dolph Yeshi, and it is, but how could you live and have no story to tell? <laughs> yeah, how could you? So, well, what, what is a life but a story that you were in the process of telling? Right. right. And I would just like to say thank you for being my, a part of my story at WNJ. It's been, I'd say we've, we've had an interesting four years together with the COVID and yeah, yeah, we, you know, we we finally met each other. Yeah, that <laughs> happened. Point. Yeah, I actually got to meet one of my professors. But you know, it's been really fun having you on the show both yeah. times, and you know, I'm I'm excited to see uh, what the future has to hold. But I, I'm yeah. certainly very glad that I've got to experience your your classes, profanity and all. Yeah, yeah. at W and J. So thank you so much, and thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. It's been very informative. Hopefully, everyone got to learn something at home. Maybe had a few laughs as well. Okay. Maybe you'll go by a. Uh, 1930 suit and pretend you're a philosopher at work tomorrow <laughs> if you want to tease your co-workers but Dr. Wolf once again thank you for coming on the show thanks for having me Sam it's been a pleasure alright everyone I hope you enjoyed Professor's Week we're lining up staff week next week we've got first year coordinator Eufeo Rogier he's coming on the show great guy talks some soccer talks some about life and his experience we actually started in the same year at WJ. he came on season one of the present tense so it's kind of a full circle moment joining on season eight the last season of the present tense but until then, everyone have a great night. Remember to live for the present sense.